here we are again, one week after Easter Day in 2024, and it's a delight to present to you another Glad Tidings Hour program, and I trust it will be a blessing and a challenge to your hearts. We're going to open our program today with a great and well-known old hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, Zion City of Our God. And it's Michael Eldridge who is our singer today as we open up our Glad Tidings Hour program. Let's enjoy this great song. Glorious things of Thee are spoken, Zion City of our God. He whose word cannot be broken, for Thee for His own abode. On the rock of ages founded, what can shake thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, thou may smile at all thy foes. See the streams of living water springing from eternal love. Well, supply thy sons and daughters, and all fear of want remove. Who can fade while such a river ever flows their thirst assuage? Grace which, like the Lord, the giver, never fails from age to age. Savior, sins of Zion City, I through grace a member am. Let the world deride or pity, I will glory in thy name. Fading is the worldling's pleasure, all his boasted pomp and show. So the joys and lasting treasure, none but Zion's children know. Well, it's absolutely true today that glorious things are spoken in the Bible of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, as you very well know, the most glorious truth is that he is alive, alive forevermore. Last week I was sharing with you the glorious truth of the resurrection and that continuing glorious message that he lives after the power of an endless life. And because of that, there are people today all around the world who rejoice in the name of Jesus Christ, who have his living presence within their hearts and their lives. And one of those that I'm going to allow you to listen to today is a good friend of ours, Andy Lovell. And he is going to be my guest today. And we're going to sit back now and uh, let's uh, hear Andy share as Yvonne and I went to his home and he and Ruth live in a lovely district of our Northern Ireland near Hillsborough. And we shared with them in fellowship and I took the opportunity to interview Andy. So we're going to listen to that interview just now. It's a great and special joy for me to present Mr. Andy Lovell, as our guest on Glad Tidings Are today. Andy and his wife Ruth have been good friends of ours for quite a number of years. And some of you will know him and you will have seen him and heard him perhaps speaking and sharing in services and churches and whatever in his ministry. But Andy, good to meet you, good to be here with you and Ruth today. And we're going to hear something about yourself about uh, childhood years, a wee bit about your ministry, how you came to be, to where you are and what you're doing today. Yes. So we'd like you to share with us about uh, early childhood memories, yeah. where you grew up. Well, I tell boys and girls, I went to church for nine months before I was born. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in my mother's belly, yeah. But uh, So I was brought up in a Christian family. My father would have been a brethren man um, when, when he grew up, but my mother wasn't saved till she was 16, but time I came along, yeah, 
But then we went to a Baptist church, and uh, when I was about nine, we started going to a Pentecostal church. But I realised, didn't matter what church you went to, I realised when I was nine, I had my own Bible. I believed in God, and I believed Jesus loved me. I knew he died on the cross. I knew he rose again. I had no doubt in believing that. I didn't do drugs. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a bully, but I realised when I was 11 years old that I wasn't saved, you know, I was I was maybe a good little boy, maybe parents didn't think so, but, you know, but I need to be saved. At the age of the age of 11, down in the south of England, I, I received Christ as my saviour. Yeah. So that's where you get your accent yeah. from? Yeah. Yes. London. Yeah, I was born in a place called Walthamstow, which is about three and a half miles from Bow. Now, if you can hear the sound of Bow Bells, they say, yeah, we've got me. <laughs> oh, I see. Right. Oh, very good. Well, I hope you all understand Andy because his accent is a little different to what we're accustomed to. So uh, listen in very carefully. Tell us what happened to you after you sought the Lord at 11 years of age. Take us along the journey. Yes, yeah, so, well, I gave my heart to when I was 11. And my school life was never, I was never too bright at school. I struggled with school, I had learning difficulties. And uh, the last year of school, they put a group of us lads that really they couldn't do anything with. They sent us to a college one day a week to, to learn building. We did plumbing and carpentry and, and brick line. And I just loved the brick line. And I thought, oh, wow, this is, this is what I want to do. I found something that I could do. You know, usually the kids that can't read and write can play football, but I couldn't even play football. So I really hated school with a passion, as it were. <laughs> so, but when I left school... Um, so I did an apprenticeship in Brick Lane, and I love my work, you know, you drive around London and you say, I built that, I built that, and, you know, you put a little part of it. Yes. But I, I love my work, but then, you know, the time I got to 19, Eric, I was, I was sort of, I was backslidden. And um, I was in church, I was, you know, I was doing all the right things, but I was, I was cold in heart, and I just knew, you know, the Bible says, let your body be a living sacrifice, holy. Pleasing, acceptable unto the Lord. My, my life wasn't holy no. and it wasn't pleasing. But I remember sitting in a little meeting one day and was singing a little chorus and it, it just was speaking about Calvary and I just started to think about how much the Lord loves me. You know, Paul said, the Son of God that loved me and gave himself for me. And I thought he did it for me. And I, I just in that little, it was a little house meeting. I was sitting, you know, at the right side of the chimney breast, but just there. I just recommitted my heart to the Lord. It, there was no the preaching hadn't started, but I just knew I just I needed to give my all for Christ. I was living a lie. I was in church, but I, you know I was living a lie. But I remember that day, and uh, you know I just I wanted to tell people about Jesus, and and on the building sites I was trying to tell people. And I remember inviting one young lady came to the church a couple of times, and but I, I really you know because you know the Bible says to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord yes. Jesus Christ. And I think, you know, that's the reason I didn't go on for the Lord. I, I, I couldn't, I didn't read because I couldn't read. I see. And, and, uh, but when I, you know, the age of 19, I, I just, I, you know, came That back. was a real turning point yeah, for you. Life. Yeah. yeah. So, I, because, I, anyway, I was trying to witness to people, but then not long after that, um, a friend of mine had gone up to a place called Peterhead in Scotland. Oh yes. Where there was a little Bible training centre and it was a two year course and he, he, he said, you, why don't you come up to the Bible training centre? And I said, oh no, I didn't, I'd had enough studying, you know, 11 years of school. <laughs> yeah. But I, I prayed about it. I just really wanted God's will in my life and I prayed about it. I said, Lord, if you want me to go, you just have to show me very plainly. I'm a very simple fella. And uh, I remember on a Wednesday night where the youth meeting on the Wednesday night and there was a man from America and just a visiting preacher who was visiting speaking on the Wednesday to the youth and the weekend to the um, to the in the meeting and uh, he just looked at me and another fella and he said you two fellas he said God has called you to do He's got, you know God has called you to do something you need you need to just get on and do it he did that's all he said he wasn't oh, well. he wasn't so I just went in on the I went in, that was a Wednesday, the following, I told my parents I was going to go to Bible school. They, they didn't discourage me, but I knew the whole family thought, why would he go back to studying when he, he didn't, you know, he didn't he just didn't school. understand. Yeah, but um, I went in on the following Monday, I gave my notice in, and my charge and just sort of, you know, he, he didn't really, he just sort of laughed. But I went then, and my auntie said to me, my, I knew my, my, my father's, Sister, I said, why are you going to Bible school? I said, oh, auntie, I'm only going for two years. 
And when I come back, I'll be able to witness better on the building sites. But um, God, God had other plans. Yeah, God knew mm -hmm. that. At the Bible College, uh, you mentioned before we came on the interview, you said it was there that you actually met Ruth. She was there too. Yeah, well, so it was a great advantage just at that time, not being able to read because of right. No, but the, the lecturer would be writing stuff on the board. Well, I could hardly read it, let alone copy it down. But in those days, you had the carbon sheets. Remember the carbon sheets and the pen? So I said to this young lady with blonde hair and blue eyes in front of me, I said, do you think, I said, if I brought an extra pad and some carbon paper, I could get a copy of your notes? And that was, that was Ruth. But we, it was lovely because we became friends. You know, we just became friends. And then after two years, that, that just, just well, the last few months of Bible school, yeah, we... The Lord we, brought your lives together. Right, yeah. And that's amazing. And of course, then uh, that just set you up in ministry for... Uh, the years ahead, uh, the Lord opened up doors for you, Andy, uh, that we have known you, especially through the doors God opened for you. And I remember when we first brought you over to Northern Ireland many years ago. Yeah. I remember you coming. But tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, you know, when you leave Bible school, everybody wants to put a label on you. That you're going to be a, a pastor, a youth pastor, an evangelist. And, and we, we prayed, we said, Lord, what do, you, what do you want us to be? What do you want us to do? And there's a little verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, and it says, Moreover, it's required in a steward to be found faithful. And it was like, Lord said, you know, because we weren't anyone. We're just, we're, new, we're just unlearned fishermen, as it were. But, you know, we just took every opportunity. So, mm -hmm. you know, we went, sometimes, I, I, now I work for a local builder. So, so we didn't, like, go you know, from secular work into full-time work. I worked, because I, I did an apprenticeship in Brick Lane, our pastor's son-in-law was 20 years my senior, but he was like a, a local builder. So I worked with him and he said, look, he said, if you go self-employed, he said, you can work with me. He said, I'll pay you when you're with me. He said, but I'll not pay you when you're doing the mission. <laughs> so yes. so it, it was like, for, for about 14 years, I would, when it happened like this, sometimes I would be working with him in the morning and I'd go home and I'd be, you know, all muddy and dirty. I'd go home and get washed and showered. And, that, and then we'd go to a school together, take an assembly. Oh, you did go to school? Yeah, we did school assemblies. And uh, we just took every opportunity. We had opportunities in schools. It was all primary schools. And um, Not many people know about that ministry that you had. Was it a big ministry or widespread? or? Yeah, well, it grew. We, we First of all, we just was in about six or seven schools. But um, for, for a few years... and. I would often been away from home doing preaching, doing missions, but then we really felt we really felt to put that work first. So you know, it's important. The first uh, we believe that the first mission field is your is your home. Yes. We have a little sign as we leave our church. It says you're in a mission field, but really every every man should have that above his front door because you know that's yeah. our first mission field. Yeah. We really felt that, and when we when we really felt to put that work first, it was amazing. We, we've never asked to go into any schools in our life and uh, and the, the doors just flew open, you know. It was it just like it was a snowball, schools just kept asking us. And that was all in the northeast of Scotland? In, yeah, all in the northeast, all in about a 35 mile radius, yeah. I see. And uh, in the end we were going into, well, in, at one time we were doing 57 assemblies a month, yeah. That was because some schools we went into mm -hmm. twice a month. But we had open, openings into over 40 schools, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. and they wanted us. Andy, that uh, mission field that you spoke about a moment or two ago, which was your home and your family, uh, obviously uh, you're referring to your children. Yeah. Uh, you and Ruth had a family. Yeah. Yes. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, well, our, our first born was Matthew, and he's uh, he's forty one this April. So, mm -hmm. and then Dawn Joy, she would she would have been forty this year, and then Leah is our youngest. She's uh, she she's now married and living in Louisiana, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and she's thirty four. I think that's right. Yeah, I see. But, uh, but then Dawn Joy, as you know, you know in. Uh, in 2007, Dawn Jo was actually over, over here in Northern Ireland. She was working with a little church. Well, first of all, she, 
not work in full, but just part of a little church in, in Forest Side, and then and then a little church in Ballinage. I see. Uh, but um, in 2007, it was June. It was June the 25th, 2007. It was a Monday night. I was in a place, little place called Bottom, in just outside Peterhead. Ruth was at home, and uh, it was the day of the mobile phone, so I got a phone call and said she needs to come home because Dawn Joy had just just taken a seizure. So anyway. I came home, and uh, the next day, Ruth, we hadn't met, but the next day we had an assembly in Aberdeen, so we went and did the assembly in Aberdeen, then I dropped Ruth off at the uh, airport, and she flew straight over to Northern Ireland, and in that week, in that week, Dawn Joy was told that um, she, she, she had a brain tumour, and it was cancerous, and it was, they said there's nothing they could do, they said they could treat it with radiotherapy, but they said it may give her a couple of years, she may only have a couple of months, they said, but there was nothing they could do. But, you know, Donja wasn't flippant, but she was saved, actually, in our little gospel tent when she was nine, on the west coast of Scotland, a little place called Arca. Mm -hmm. And she, she just said to the nurses, she said, well, I'm not afraid to die. And, uh, and she wasn't afraid to die, because, of course, death has no sting to the belief. She knew where she was going. But uh, they said, well, if you're going to take the treatment, you need to take it immediately. She said, oh, no, I'll not take it until my mum and dad, we, we were coming over here to do a tent mission in, in Ballin, and she I said, I'll not take it until the tent mission's finished. So she would have grown up like with us doing tent missions. She was used to putting up the tent. She sat in all the children's meetings. And like I say, she got saved in the tent. And um, so she did. She was involved in the tent mission. She actually gave a testimony on a Tuesday night. And um, it was the week after that. She she went well. She had a tri she the tent mission finished on the the Sunday. She had a first radiotherapy on the Thursday after that, and on the Monday after that, the sixth of sixth of August, she went home to be with the Lord. It was six weeks to the day, but um, of course we miss her very much. But we know where she is, and you know though though we sorrow, you know there's 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 been a lot of tears and pain, you know. For us, but not for her. We, no. she, she's in a far better place. I remember Don Joy. Yes, I do. And I remember the day we were at the funeral. And the Lord was greatly glorified yeah. at that yeah. service. Um, Andy, um, now as the years have moved on and uh, you're now located in Northern Ireland, living here uh, near Hillsborough area, Balnehinch. Um, you're still involved with school work, yeah, to oh, some yeah. extent. In, not not as much because in Northern Ireland there's a lot more, um, you know, children workers. In Scotland there was hardly yes. anyone else going. In yes, there. yeah, but we still we're still in schools. In fact, I was in a school just on Friday that we've not been in since 2011. Yes, yeah, so, see. Um, you have a companion who goes with you on all your journeys, actually. Yeah, yeah, my it's wife. a fascinating <laughs> story, yes, your wife and another uh, very interesting character. And so many people have uh, uh, seen this character that goes with you. But that was an interesting story, how you came to have this individual to be your companion in ministry. And you'll maybe tell us that just in a few sentences, yeah. and then let us see him. Yeah, well... My little friend's called Freddie, <laughs> but uh, he was given to me. I was preaching in Lancaster. It was a Monday night. It was a little over a pond. It was a little fellowship. A couple came to me and they said, we've got something for you. We promised to use it. And uh, I hope it was in a cardboard box and I looked through and I could just see tartan. I could see tartan. And I just, they, this couple was always messing about and I thought, oh, they, they brought me a kilt because, you know, we were from England. Oh, and, yeah. And I said, oh yeah, I'll use it. I just thought it was a big joke. When I opened it, it was, this, it was a puppet. And I really, I knew they'd never would, I wouldn't have given you a tuppence for it at the time. I'd never done puppets and had no desire to do puppets. And uh, But it's been a tremendous, it's been a tremendous tool. We don't do puppet shows, but, you know, we use the little puppet. Sometimes in the schools you can come over with a, a very strong message, uh, but it's like a little spoonful of sugar. You know, we get it out always at the end of the, end of the lesson. We don't use it in all the schools, but in the schools that we do, you know, you just get it out. And then the children's meeting, I've seen this the other day, or a few weeks ago, you know, maybe a child comes in and they're a bit 
bit, you know, first time in and a bit nervous, his little Freddie had come out and sing a song and he, uh -huh. yeah, so he, he can sing Tim yeah. if you want. Oh yeah, that would be lovely. Let's, uh, let's okay. see him. Kisses. Oh well, it's Uncle Eric. Hello oh, Freddie. It's been a long time. <laughs> oh, I hate you. Yeah, your hand's a little soft Freddie, yeah. but it's Hello. just lovely to see you. Freddie, want you to sing a little song for you look in the camera. Is this like doing the YouTube? This is exactly like doing the YouTube, yeah. Oh, I'm good at this. Okay. You gonna sing a little song? Yeah. Can I can I just tell you something? What do you want to tell me? I love Jesus with all my heart. And do you know where your heart is? Where's your heart? In my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you sing Freddie, you sing a little song. Can you sing about God's love? Oh yeah. God's love is like a circle, a circle deep and round. And when you have the circle, no ending can be found. Forever and forever, through all eternity. God's love is like a circle, I know that he loves me. God's love is like a circle, a circle, deep and round. And when you have the circle, no ending can be found. Forever and forever, through all eternity. God's love is like a circle, I know that he loves me. That's lovely, Freddie, but why is God's love like a circle? Well, because circle never ends. It never ends, that's right. And God's love goes on forever, another, another, and infinity, and beyond. That's lovely, Freddie. Have you got a verse, Freddie, that uh, talks about God's love? Oh, this is me favourite. Go on, then. <coughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, that's everyone, yeah. mm -hmm. that Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 3, verse 16. Well done. Yeah, that's the favourite. And I've got another favourite. Just one more then. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 23. <laughs> thank you. Freddie, thank you for all the enjoyment and everything that you have shared with us over the years. We really appreciate you and we pray that God will use your testimony and your singing and your verses oh. in the days to come. Well, oh, thank you so much. Wow. Do you want me to go in back now? <laughs> you say goodbye nicely. Okay. Well, thanks so much. See you later. That's all nicely. Okay. Can I sit next to Aunt Eva? Yeah, you sit next to <laughs> So that's little Freddie. Yeah, but it's been very tall. Yes. Yeah, and uh, like I say, in the schools, sometimes we said, wow, that was a powerful message. But, you know, in the schools, we don't just, we just, you know, the Bible says, be as wise as serpents, harmless as doves, and, you know, we just tread little by little. That's why we like, if we can, to go. Well, yes. in the North East, we went to schools every month. So you could build up and some every, yes. every fortnight. So you could build up and, and you just get a little bit more, you know. You just know, like, when you can just bring the message powerfully. And, but the puppet was good because you just... Yes, you know, yes, it's really a tool that yeah. you've, you've used to evangelise well. And it's got a sim uh, one day a lady was invited to this school and uh, the headmistress, which was, she was very excited, you know what I was like. She was a very good headmistress and... Uh, I said, what have we got, 25 minutes? She says, 20 minutes. And I said, what have we got, half an hour? She said, no, 20 minutes. I says, 25 minutes? She said, 20 minutes. And I knew an issue. So Ruth and I did the chorus. I did the Bible lesson. I watched the clock and we finished in 20 minutes. She said, no, do the puppet. <laughs> so we got on 25 minutes. <laughs> but, but the reason was she, she'd heard about us, but she'd never seen us. And she was a good teacher. She was old school. She just wanted to check us out. And, after that, we did get longer, but it's it's good to like that. Yes, yes. And uh, what's your 
Have you got a favorite Bible verse? Or what would you like the rest of your life to be? I'd like the rest of my life just to be spent. You know, I think that woman, she wasted, you know, she wasted the alabaster box. And I just want to waste my life. I remember years ago, I was doing, a, I was doing a, an open air in, in Dol a place called um, Kirby Longstown. Oh, yes, I know. And uh, a lady said to me, she said, have you got nothing better to do, young fella? It's a long time ago. I said, no, I've got nothing better to do. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, you know, when we, when we, you know, when you die, oh, I'm going to leave my children about 40 flannel graphs, <laughs> flashcards, and, and a puppy. But, yeah, we just won. We've just spent our life. We've, we've never asked to go anywhere, or, but we've been a lot of places and sharing the gospel and preaching them. And, and it's wonderful because we just know, we know that we're not anything. You know, I met, I, I met a friend of mine that I used to travel with, he gave a tremendous illustration, I've never forgot it. And he said, if you, if you, you see all this, even this camera today, it's a lovely camera and, I, and you know, and a lovely speaker and all this electrical equipment, but without the little fuse, without the little fuse, there would all be nothing. But that, the, that fuse, and really I'm just, and Ruth and I, we're just little fuses you know, when that fuse is finished with, you just throw it out. You, you know, you don't, you don't put it on the wall, a little mm -hmm. plaque, and this fuse was used to run this organ for 35 years. But, and that, we just, you know, you, and God, we're available for God to use us. And we know, even, even the work in the schools in Peterhead, it's important to say, you know, that work, we didn't, when we came to Northern Ireland, we didn't want to leave that work undone. And, and there was a, a younger, well, younger than us, anyway, 10 years Young and us, a young fellow, full of energy, and he's continued the work. Wow, okay. So, so the, work, the work wasn't our work, it was Lord's sure. work. And yes. when we moved, the work just continued. And, and he can run faster than us, and so he's in more schools than we were. So, yeah, we, I just want to waste my life on the gospel. And my favourite verse is that one of Freddie, the son of God that loved me. Yeah. I, I know there's a lot of lovely verses in the Bible. Absolutely. I love his loving kindness is better than life. You know, whatever life may bring. You know, even with Louis, Louis and Dawn Joy, you know, that's what brings us through. His loving kindness is, is better than life. Whatever life may bring, his, his loving kindness brings us through. And people said to us, you know, people, you know, when these things happen, you know, I remember we was in Midlaw, a place called Midlaw in, in North East, and I said to I said to someone, God is good. And they said, do you, do you really believe that? And he was a confessing Christian. But the, the thing is, when tragedies happen in life, if you really know God and love God, it just draws you closer to him. It doesn't take you away from him. And, because his loving kindness is better than whatever life may bring. Amen. Yeah, Amen. It really is. Amen. Well, Andy, thank you so much for opening up your heart and sharing with us today something about yes. your life. Yes. and your family and your ministry and we pray that the Lord will bless you and Ruth thank you. and uh, all that you seek to do for the Saviour thank you in the days much. to come. Thank you Eric. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Now I know that in the interview today you didn't have an opportunity to see Ruth, his lovely wife, but here they are singing. They were taking a service in a local church in Northern Ireland, in Ballymena Independent Methodist Church, actually, some time ago. And he and Ruth were singing, He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. I think you will enjoy them as they sing this lovely song to us today. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. His grace has no measure, His power. 
and give it and give it again. Now, do you remember Andy and Ruth? Do you pray for them and their family as you were listening to the interview? You would have share, heard him share uh, some of their experiences uh, with their family growing up and, of course, the challenges and the faith that they showed in difficult times in their lives. We praise God for them and pray the Lord will continue to use them in their ministry, in schools and wherever they go. Now I'm going to read with you today from the Gospel according to St. John. We're going to read from chapter 20. We're going to commence our reading at verse 24. But Thomas one of the twelve, called Didymus, which means twin, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you might have life through his name. Now we do pray that God will bless the reading of his precious word to our hearts today. Please join me for a moment of prayer before we come to the message for this program. Our Father, we thank you that after the morning of resurrection, there were many days and opportunities for your children and the disciples particularly to see you again and again. And we thank you for this momentous time and occasion just a week after Easter Day whenever you appeared to your disciples and Thomas was with them. We pray that as we share your word, you will bless the message to all our hearts today. In Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. If I was going to use a title today for my message, taken from this scripture reading, it would be Stop Doubting or Stop Being Faithless. Start believing. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. An eventful week had just passed since resurrection morning, and it's just a week after resurrection day, as we were celebrating last Lord's Day. The little band of disciples were no longer in doubt. They knew their Lord was alive, and each moment in his presence confirmed their convictions. But there was one exception, and that exception was Thomas. Thomas had not been present at the initial appearance, as we read in the passage, and he was in no state to believe what the others were telling him. In fact, God's word says, Believe and you will see. But for Thomas, it could be said, his attitude was, see and I will believe. 
Except I shall see the nail prints, I will not believe. Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Those are the exact words of this man Thomas. I venture to say today, there are so many people who take the same position as Thomas. There are those who, at best, are honest doubters. And that would be putting a nice construction, perhaps, on Thomas. But it may be more accurate to say today that Thomas was a willful unbeliever. And there are those like that today, many, who are willful unbelievers. There are those who can't believe because they're honest doubters. And then there are those who won't believe, even though there is multiple evidence for the fact that Jesus Christ is alive and that he really changes lives. And they have seen lives being changed. They know the message of the gospel, but they just won't believe. Whereas there are others, and because of their attitude, mentally or whatever, they can't believe. But John the Apostle sets out his message with the purpose of providing evidence for faith to all who read. Almost a hundred times in this gospel, we have that concept of believing. Some 36 times in John's gospel, he speaks of life and all of this mounts up in evidence that Jesus Christ is the one on whom we should believe and the one who gives to everyone who believes life that has no ending. In fact, John, of all the gospel writers, concludes his gospel with the purpose, the reason as to why he wrote this gospel. He said, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, ye might have life through his name. It must have been an incredible moment when the risen Christ appeared in the presence of the disciples with Thomas in the company. But there was more to come. He addressed Thomas directly, speaking the very words that Thomas had spoken during that intervening week. And what, would, what did we read? Well, here's what we read. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Stop being faithless, but start believing. At that moment, God's spirit and power broke in upon Thomas and he cried out almost spontaneously, it might seem, a confession of faith, my Lord and my God. Now, he wasn't using those words as people use them commonly these days, which is really taking the name of the Lord in vain. He was using them as a confession of his trust and his faith in Jesus Christ. And if I was to put it literally, it would be like this, the Lord of me and the God of me. He is my Lord. He is now my God. And for me today to say, my Lord and my God, I am confessing my utmost faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life, and the God of my salvation. Is that your confession? Or may it be that you're the person today who still uses these two terms, but you use them as a swear word. You use them as taking the Lord's name in vain. You know what the Bible says? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord thy God will not hold him guiltless, that taketh his name in vain. Let that commandment sink in to your thinking and to your life. 
Coming back to the passage, Thomas believed because he had seen. But the commendation that followed is just as real and relevant today as it was when it was first spoken to Thomas, when Jesus said, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. We read that in the 29th verse. And from that moment, the man who would not believe in his heart until he had seen with his eyes followed and served the Lord Jesus Christ until he breathed his final breath. The gospel emphasis is a faith message. It's not based on rationale, although it's not averse to that, but it's not based on human perceptions or seeing with the naked eye. In fact, almost a hundred times, as I've already said, John emphasizes this matter of faith of believing, of believing the words that are spoken, of trusting because of what Jesus Christ said and did, and of course, most of all, because of what he did at Calvary's cross, and of course, in the glorious resurrection, which was the receipt for all that had been wrought out on the cross of Calvary in his dying hours. Jesus said, those who exercise faith in him are blessed. And that is more than just a good feeling. It's more than mental assent. It's the experiencing of peace and joy and pardon and assurance in this life and for that which is to come by taking God at his word. Let me leave with you three simple and brief thoughts about what we are to believe. First of all, we are to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. As I've said to you in John chapter 20, in the final verses of that chapter, and many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, the book of John, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. And fundamental to that, of course, is that confession that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the eternal Son of God. He is the second person of the Trinity. He had no beginning. He is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and the blessed Holy Spirit. This was a fundamental article of faith in John's message. And it's also essential to the experience of salvation. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus vindicated the claim that he made. And the Apostle Paul opens his epistle to the Romans by stating that Jesus Christ is declared or horizoned to be the Son of God with power. How? By the resurrection from the dead. You find those words in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. And so like the sun rising in his glorious strength in the morning hours, Jesus Christ by his resurrection is like the sun of righteousness coming up in glorious splendor after giving up his life as a sacrifice and an offering on Calvary's cross. The question is, does it really matter what I believe about Jesus Christ? Yes, it does. And here is one of the great cornerstones of New Testament truth and New Testament salvation. He that believeth on the Son, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And you find that in John chapter 3 and verse 36. What is the significance of the term? Well, it is, as I've already intimated. He is eternally God, co-equal with the Father. He's not Michael the archangel. He's not Gabriel the angelic messenger. But he is God of very God, as we find in the early creedal statements of the church, in church history. The uncreated one, the one who took on flesh and came to dwell among us. Not everyone believes that. The false cults do not believe that. But it is a fundamental precept and concept and truth 
of vital biblical Christianity. Thomas saw and believed. We do not have the privilege that Thomas had, but we can be among the blessed, who though they cannot see with the naked eye, can believe unto salvation. My question to you is, have you believed? Have you placed your trust in the Son of God to be your Savior? You say, yes, I have. Well, praise God. Thank you so much. And praise the Lord today for such a great salvation. And thank Him today for wonderful grace that brought you to a living faith in Jesus Christ as God's Messiah and God's eternal Son. The second thing about believing is that you believe, or we need to come to believe, that Christ's sacrifice provides a free and full salvation. In chapter 19 and verse 30, the Apostle John records our Lord's final words on Calvary's cross. It is finished. The word means perfected. It was a victorious cry. It wasn't a cry of defeat. It wasn't a cry of, my time is up and my time is over. No, it was a cry of victory. The price has been paid in full to provide a free and full salvation for the whosoever will. My dear people, that's why he came into our world. He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. He suffered outside the gate, says the writer to the Hebrew people, believers, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. Again, in writing to Titus in that little letter in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, He gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify us unto himself. So this salvation sets people free from the condemnation of an unforgiven past, so many people live under the condemnation of their past transgressions. And of course today you can't remove that guilt by good works or by baptism or confirmation or effort of your own. The fact is that all are under divine condemnation. But the Bible says, He that believeth is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. We speak about being set free from sin's penalty. Do you know anything about this in your life? There is also the glorious privilege of knowing deliverance from sin as an indwelling principle. Indeed, in those wonderful verses, wonderful Bible verses that I quoted a moment ago, they major on that truth. And this emphasis is on the removal of that sin word proneness. An inward pollution. How is it accomplished? By a perfect cleansing. A cleansing from all unrighteousness. And oh, what power there is in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You say, Eric, do you really believe that? Do you not think that we must struggle with this for the rest of our lives until death gives us a welcome release? Well, if I believed that, I would have to go against my convictions, not only of personal experience, but also of biblical truth, because every time we read about cleansing, well, except for this First John chapter 1 reference, where it speaks about a continuous cleansing and keeping on and keeping us clean, just as if flowing water flowing over us constantly keeps us clean, elsewhere in the New Testament, to be cleansed, to be sanctified, it's in the aorist imperative in the Greek original. And that speaks of a crisis work, an instant experience. Thank God today for the clarity of the Bible in making our hearts pure, in making us clean every whit. And my dear friends, having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, that's outward, and inwardly, and the Spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. 
Oh, what power there is in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. My friends, we are treading on sacred ground when we're speaking about the power of the precious blood of Jesus. Coming back to our Bible text, what did it say? Because thou hast seen, thou hast believed. Blessed are they which have not seen, and yet have believed. Thomas looked upon the wound prints that were still visible on our Savior's resurrected body, and faith laid hold of the merits of the precious blood shedding which those wounds signified. The question arises, do you believe, have you believed, that Christ's sacrifice provides a free salvation for all sinners? Do you possess that experience and that blessing? And do you believe or will you believe that Christ's sacrifice provides a full cleansing and purifying from all sin? Do you know that blessing of a heart by blood made clean in every wish and thought, a heart that by God's power has been into subjection brought? It is indeed a blessing spoken of by Jesus himself when he said, Oh, the blessedness! or blessed are the pure in heart. My faith, like the hymn says, has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me do plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. In conclusion, what must I believe? First, that Jesus is the Son of God, the true Messiah, that Jesus Christ's sacrifice on Calvary's cross has purchased a free pardon and a full deliverance for me from my sin. And thirdly, believing that his risen life indwells those who trust him. This is why there was such dynamic in the apostles after the resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, with particular emphasis on the ascension and the coming of the Spirit. The risen life of Jesus Christ, communicated by the ministry of the Spirit at the advent of the Spirit at Pentecost, became the dynamic of the apostles' lives. His resurrection became the message of their ministry. The power of the resurrection became the theology of the epistles alongside the power of redemption and the message of the cross. And Thomas, the man of whom we have been speaking, became God's ambassador for the rest of his life to India. After pouring out his life in faithful service, this man Thomas, who had such a faltering start in those early days after Resurrection Day, he would lay down his life in martyrdom on the outskirts of the city of Chennai, or used to be called Madras. Some years ago, an Indian sister there in India took us to St. Thomas Mount, outside the city of Chennai. It is so named because there there is a lasting testimony to Thomas's ministry in India. His meeting with the risen Christ one week after Resurrection Day endued his life with resurrection power. He lived and died in the victory of a spirit-filled life, pursued by a mob of Hindu radicalists. Thomas laid down his life for Jesus Christ. Such a privilege was not merely for those first disciples, but for all those who will trust in Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul, who joined that apostolic band later on, said, Oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Live out thy life within me, O oh, Jesus, King of kings, be thou thyself the answer to all my questionings. O oh, how blessed are they that have not seen 
and yet have believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Christ's sacrifice provides a free and full salvation, that Christ's risen life indwells those who trust in Him. Could you join with me to express your feelings in these lovely words? I am trusting Thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only Thee, trusting Thee for full salvation, great and free. I am trusting Thee, Lord Jesus, never let me fall. I am trusting Thee forever and for all. I'm going to let you listen now to Mrs. Mildred Rainey singing, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon His promise Just to know, thus says the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I've proved Him Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life. Rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. trust thee precious Jesus Savior friend and I know that you are with me will be with me to the end Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him o'er and o'er Jesus Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Now I really feel the Lord has been talking into our hearts today, and I pray that what we have shared with you and what you have heard in the interview earlier today will touch your life and influence you and make you not just a believer and a follower, but also a bright witness, just like Thomas, for the rest of your life in the service of our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. This is Eric Stewart saying, bye-bye. God bless you all. In the meantime. <music>